uh, I have a quick message that I want to share with you, and uh, it is based on a revelation that I've received uh, many years ago that has guided uh, my life. And I want to just say, so, so this revelation is filled with principles. I was going to tell you that this was a principle, but there were so many principles that were connected to the root of the revelation that I felt like, you know, it was important for you uh, just to kind of define it as a revelation. A revelation just means you, something, a light went off and you saw something that you did not see before. It's been revealed to you. The Bible is full of revelations. Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? Some of the disciples said that thou art, you know, Elijah, you are that prophet. And Peter stood up and said, thou art the Christ, son of the living God. And Jesus made the, com the, the comment that this revelation came from God. That revelation was key. And so I want to share uh, this revelation that I kind of had the seedlings of uh, as a young man. A little bit of a backdrop for you. How many feel good today? If you were ever to listen to any message that I share with you, let me at least give you a small documentary of my early life where this revelation kind of was a little bit of a seedbed. And then when I had the crossroads of salvation, I felt like God really watered this and uh, made this a foundational uh, revelation for me. I grew up in the inner city. Some of you have been here for a long time, have probably heard that testimony before. Um, my father was an alcoholic, and my mother suffered from mental health issues. I was a runaway at 16 years old, and that was a crossroads for me. And while I look back, uh, and I, I kind of look at it from a bird's eye point of view, I do know that during the time at 16 years old, being on my own, not knowing what the future looks like, surrounded with countless temptations, um, you might say that the devil was baiting me like he does all human beings. You might even say that maybe the devil knows your potential. And he attacks you based on your potential. It's possible that the lion and the bear were under the assignment of the enemy to take out David before David reached his future. You might say that the enemy went after Moses knowing that a deliverer was coming. He didn't know which kid was going to be a deliverer. But any Jewish young man could have been the deliverer. Because anyone who yields their life to the Lord can be used to do great things. And so early on, um, drugs, alcohol, gangs back in the mid-80s, associations, all of those things were countless temptations. Education, occupation, what job, uh, storms, uh, false comforts, all of those things were kind of uh, crowding me out at the age of 16. Lonely, isolated, fatherless, motherless during those times. Um, this was a crossroads for me, not knowing what the future was going to be like. Uh, culturally, when it comes to the culture and innovation, there were no cell phones back in the mid-80s. How many, how many predate cell phones? There were still phone booths, right? Remember a phone booth? Got to find a phone booth and, you know, you know and uh, there was no internet in the 80s, mid-80s, no internet. You didn't crack open a Dell computer. There was no Dell. There was no Yahoo. No one had mail. had no one to call, still had rotary phones, you know what I'm saying? And, and so that was the cultural time that I was in. Uh, we were a culture of cultures, you might say, back then, so that just sent, meant, meant that there was emerging subcultures pulling on an individual, the subculture of associations, the subculture of gangs, the subcultures of drugs, the subculture. There were just emerging subcultures at that time. They didn't have the benefit of the internet and Google. Things were not readily at. If you didn't know something, you remained dumb. 
Does that, does that make sense? How many remember those days? You didn't know something, you stayed dumb. Nowadays, some of you are fat checking me right now. You're able to Google. When I give you a verse of scripture and I say, and I re, you just Google it because you have access to information. In the 80s, we had no access to no information. If you didn't know something, you remain not knowing something. Couldn't Google it, couldn't search the internet. You basically were stuck based on whatever experience you currently had. Ceilings were much more dominant. You might say, forget about a glass ceiling. They were like brick ceilings that you couldn't get through. Your exposure to things. I grew up in the inner city. My exposure was the inner city. My worldview was based on the inner city. My, my exposure was to the friends around me, and we were all in the same neighborhood. We all had the same limitations. We all had the same education. We had all the same experience. We were still bound by the same glass ceiling. Are you still good? Here's what I did know at 16. I didn't want to be a statistic. I wanted more. I wanted more. Then I had the crossroads at 19 of salvation. So for me, salvation was more than eternity and fire insurance. Let me say that again. Salvation for me at 19, after three years of survival from 16, 17, 18, now I'm 19, salvation for me filled the gaps and shortcomings that I had. Salvation for me gave me sonship. Let me say it again. Salvation for me gave me sonship. So when I read verses of scripture that said that I am now engrafted and I can cry, Abba, Father. As a fatherless young man, growing up in an atmosphere of abuse, knowing that God could be my father, that was a key to salvation. Salvation was the door that allowed me to enter into sonship. So for me, forget about eternity. I was basking in the reality that God actually wanted to have a personal relationship with me. That was not in the realm of my understanding growing up in Catholicism. In Catholicism, I had to go to a mediator. I didn't have access to God. I had access to a two-by-two two square where I could confess my sins to an intermediator who was a priest. So even my religious experience did not bring me into the adoption of sonship. It brought me into religion, to confirmation, to the praying of saints. It introduced me to Mary, not God. But when I got saved, I got saved in a Pentecostal church. And what, was, what I saw in the scriptures and what was given to me was the reality that God wanted to be a father unto me. And salvation gave me sonship. Salvation gave me mentorship. The Bible took on the framework of being able to guide me and give me principles and put morals in me and begin to challenge my character. Salvation gave me spiritual gifts. Salvation made me smarter. Let me say it again. Reading the Bible began to make me smarter. The gifts of the Holy Spirit were now the gift of wisdom, the gift of knowledge. I wasn't stuck on stupid any longer. I don't know what your salvation is doing for you, but for me, it revolutionized everything about me. Christianity became a culture for me. Just like the subcultures of gangs, now I was in a subculture of the kingdom. Spiritual gifts, wisdom, knowledge, administration. The more I read the Bible, I began to get smarter and I seen things differently. And all of a sudden, my speech began to change. My language. Thank God I read in King James. Whether I was eloquent, I sounded eloquent. Oh, ye. <laughs> Praise God. Salvation gave me intimacy. Having years of loneliness. Years of being the black sheep of the family. Years of just, of just being a castaway. The Bible provided me with intimacy. Salvation gave me intimacy. Gave me intimacy to the level that God put his spirit inside of me so I was never lonely. 
No matter what adverse circumstances, no matter how much I was trying to figure out life, no matter how isolated I was, no matter how alone I might be and discarded, Holy Spirit was always with me. He never walked out of the room. Salvation allowed God to dwell on the inside of me. And God was doing something internally as the world was doing something externally. Salvation opened up my eyes to more. That same revelation of wanting more, but not knowing how to achieve it. Knowing at 16, I didn't want to become a statistic. I didn't want to become another alcoholic. I didn't want to enter into drugs. Um, I, did, I didn't want to be a statistic. I wanted more. Now I begin to read the Bible, and I come across scripture verses like this. These are some of my life verses at age 19. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. But as it, as it is written, I has not seen, nor the ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. When I saw that, that became a light verse. The eye has not seen. Whatever I had seen, God had more. God was now a God of more. My spiritual father, my heavenly father, was a God that could provide more for me. And it hadn't even entered into my heart, nor did I even have a revelation of the things that God had for me. Let me just say this, because it's true for every one of you. God has more for you. I don't really care what you've achieved or not achieved. Some of you might be on the pinnacle of success. You might have a degree, you might have a business, you might be financially secure. Well, financial security is not the only type of security in life. God has more for you. Could God use someone like me? A runaway with no privilege and limited education. First Corinthians that book had become a life book for me, but here's another life set of verses out of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 25. The Apostle Paul, speaking to the Corinthian church, begins to talk about calling. How God kind of fishes for men and women and chooses them and calls them. And he says these words, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So here's what God is saying. That which you think is foolish, God looks at and says, so God choosing something that's foolish and something that is ignorant is by God's design. For you see your calling, brethren, how not many wise men after the flesh, not many wise men after the flesh, that's talking about the culture of humanity, that which is consistent, flesh being that which is earthly. So when it talks about wise men in earthly manner, it's talking about education, it's talking about degrees, it's talking about privilege, it's talking about caste system, it's talking about uh, um, uh, you would say, everybody know what a caste system is born into in the early days? Uh, you would see 2,000 years ago, people were born into a caste system. So if your father was a baker, you were a baker. If you were a laborer, you were born into the house of a laborer, and that was your generational caste system. You were cast into a particular area, and all of what you experienced was based on this. This scripture verse says, not many wise men after the flesh. So God calling people is not calling individuals that are wise after the flesh. Not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Verse 27 is me. At 19 years old, I read that. I was not the wise. I was not the noble. I was not the degreed. I was not the financially secure. I was not, I was the foolish thing. I was the castaway. I was the one who had not. Verse 27 was about me. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. The base and lowly things of the world, the things which are despised, God chose, yea, the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. There's a consistency in scripture. When he chose his disciples, he chose common folk. 
He didn't choose Sadducees. He didn't choose Pharisees. He didn't choose politicians. He didn't choose that. He chose fishermen. He chose that which was discarded. There was a consistency. God was reinforcing this revelation that not only did I want more, but he wanted to give me more. And he was not going to be restrained from giving it to me because I didn't have some type of earthly privilege or born on the right side of the train tracks. You still good? God had more. God had more. More. More to us in the 21st century. So more in my early days in 1985 and 1986, 1987, was not about unlimited money, more didn't mean tall, dark, and handsome for single ladies. It didn't mean getting a brick house bride for single men. Some of you don't even know what that means, but it didn't mean job, promotion, new car. For me, more meant more of God. More meant that which God wanted to put inside of me. Acts chapter 19, if you're writing this down, this is kind of a foundational verse uh, here. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul had passed through the upper coast coming to Ephesus and he found those certain disciples. So Apollos, who will become a spiritual son of Paul, had given his life to the Lord and they had been traveling and sharing and preaching that Christ had risen from the dead. They'd become evangelists and they were operating in the ministry. And Paul, coming by, found Apollos. They ran into each other and Apollos had disciples with him. And in verse 2 it says, And he said unto them, Apollos and the disciples that were with him, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? That's all he just simply said. And they said to him, we have not so much as even heard whether there be a Holy Ghost. Here's what they were saying to him. We've not been taught about the Holy Spirit. We did not know it was available to us. We never heard of such a thing. Think about that for a second. They had been in scripture. They had been reading and sharing the good news of Christ. They had been immersed in salvation. But they had not been immersed in the power of the Holy Spirit. They were already in ministry. They were operating in ministry. But what you don't know, you don't know. They couldn't Google, is there more? They couldn't go to YouTube and find Paul on YouTube. Laying hands on people. And they were being filled with the Holy Spirit. They didn't know about miracles. They didn't know about the power of the Holy Spirit. That they had authority over demons and doctrines of devil. They didn't know. Because what you don't know, you don't know. It's not an issue of belief. Scripture states these men believed, but they did not receive. They didn't receive because they didn't know they could receive. And because they couldn't or didn't, they remained in the same spot that they were. I emphasize, or I cannot emphasize enough how important it is that you are in a church that increases your capacity. Let me say that again. I, I, I'm on a, I want to be very clear. Church is supposed to be a place that just doesn't confirm what you already know. Hi, I'm Pastor, also known as Captain Obvious. And I just want to reinforce what you already know. Now, for some people, that is exactly what they want in life. They want the type of church that doesn't push the envelope that doesn't challenge them to go into places they've never gone before. No, they don't want to be uncomfortable. They want to be comforted in a deeper level of comfort. Does that make sense? 
Church should be a place that increases your capacity for more, that challenges you, that you can be greater, you can have more. God wants more to give you. He wants more of you. He wants more of you. An effective and skilled teacher introduces information that you were not taught. One that reveals stuff you didn't know was available. I believed for 35 years of ministry that my assignment, my level of success in part is going to be for me determined by you leaving here and saying, I never heard of such a thing. Does that make sense? You get done with the message, you say, I didn't know that before. I'm challenged to do things that I've never done before. That you would leave with something priceless. Teaching's a lifestyle. Paul's instruction to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved. This is really in the confounds of ministry here. Paul saying to Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Timothy was supposed to immerse himself in discovering within the scriptures things that were not yet revealed. He needed revelation. If you remember, the New Testament had not been written yet. They were reading in the Old Testament. And so you needed the Holy Spirit to give you revelation, to identify messianic verses of Scripture. To ident- you couldn't turn to 1 Corinthians because it wasn't written yet. You needed to rely on the Holy Spirit. You couldn't go to Strong's Concordance. You couldn't pull out your Bible app. You didn't have daily bread. You didn't have television where there was preacher after preacher after preacher. You actually had to walk to church. Find a church. Find a preacher. You actually had to want more to get more. Today we're surrounded with more, but are we actually experiencing more? Paul writes to Timothy and he says, you you need to show yourself approved unto God. As a teacher, the content of your message needs to have God's approval. Just like me needs to have an FDA approval. So the message needs to have God's approval. I would challenge you today and I would just simply say as humbly as I can that probably 90% of what's preached in America is not Holy Ghost approved. You say, well, how could you say that? Look at the content of the culture. Look at the position of the church. Look at the, look at the voice of the church. Amen. Timothy's told to show thyself approved unto God. At the end of the day, the content of the message needs to have God's approval. A workman that needeth not to be. This is a workman who works and labors in the text to provide the congregation. Revelation. Don't confuse cheerleaders and quarterbacks. Don't confuse junk food with steak and potatoes. Scripture says these men believed, but they did not receive. You can go to church. There could be shouting, dancing, singing, hollering, yelling, all of that stuff. There could be the raising of hands. You could be in the place where God is, but not receive what God wants you to receive. You could say, I believe. Have you received? We didn't know we could receive. There is a process to receiving. This is the revelation that God had. One, the revelation, and I talked about this early, is that there was a hunger in me, one, to survive. Two, once I connected to God for intimacy, and once God established himself in the adoption of sonship for me, that had become a strength to me. And I knew that God was going to be uh, the director and mover and barrier breaker for me in my life. And that there was a process. There was going to be a process to move, to, to, 
to be able to be moved from just believing to receiving. When you look at the text and you see a principle, you see a promise, you see a blessing, um, and, and you see it there and you believe it. Believing it is only one portion of it. How many believe God wants to have you to be successful? We all believe it. Okay, what's the process then? How many believe God doesn't want you to be alone? Good, what's the process then? How many believe God wants you to be fruitful? Good, that believing's only one portion of it. What's now the process from moving? Paul says to Apollos, do you believe? Yes, I believe. Have you received? Didn't even know we could receive. Process to receiving. Because your need and your want and your tears does not produce change. That's what I learned early on. I can cry all day to God. Weep. I could, I could have needs, put my needs before God, put all of my wants before God, but really that was not going to be the process. The process to receiving was not going to be me expressing that I want something. Does that make sense? I couldn't just stay at the table and say, uh, as a child, I want, I want, I want more, I want more, I want more. There had to be a process to that. We do this even with our grants, and I want more. Okay, well, sit down. Sit down. And let's prepare you to have more. Eat what's on the plate, and we'll give you more. Finish what you're doing. Like, there's a process to that. You still good? Thank you. That's just one person telling me that's right. Everyone else is like, I, wasn't, I didn't come to church for a process. I just came because I'm a believer. Okay, number one, if you're going to take notes, write this down. The first step of receiving, and I have quick, quick ones here. Number one is that you have to receive an instruction. In order, to remove, in order to move from believing to receiving. So Paul says to Apollos, have you been filled with the Holy Ghost? We don't know nothing about the Holy Ghost. He now gives, needs to give them an instruction. Then if you want to receive the Holy Ghost, here is the instruction. Obedience, this is an old Torah principle. Obedience produces change or obedience triggers events that bring blessing your obedience to an instruction triggers a blessing in your life it brings and triggers events and brings about blessing the opposite is true too disobedience triggers events that brings cursing brings poverty brings sickness Obedience triggers events in your life. When I begin to be obedient to the instruction that God has for me, he begins to move things around in my life to bring me to the place of receiving. You still good? Principles activate promises. Instructions and words need to be awakened in your spirit. So that simply means instructions or the word of God needs to be activated. When you read through the text of your Bible and the word is the seed and it's planted in the soil of your, in, of your life, then it needs to be activated. It needs to be awakened. Otherwise, the seed stays dormant. The seed just stays. Seeds can stay dormant in soil that won't activate them for years. You could put seed in a package, bring it to a nursery, and it could be on the shelf there for a number of time, months on the shelf, but not until you take that seed and do you plant it in the ground till you flip it over to the back of the package of seed and it has instructions. It says when to plant it, when to water it, the type of atmosphere it's supposed to be in. If you do those things, then the seed... Now, if you deny those instructions then you should have no expectation of seeing what was on the front of the package of the seed, which was the picture of the potential that that seed had. Here's the wonderful thing on, about seeds. So when God looks down, he just sees a numerous amounts of seed. We don't know what the potential is until it's planted, and only God knows the various 
culture or uh, cultivation that needs to happen for that seed. Take all the seeds out of a package, put them together, and very few people can identify the seed. They can identify the plant. Oh, that plant's a tulip. Oh, that plant's a rose. That's a tomato seed or a tomato. But can you identify the difference in the seed? God identifies the difference in the seed and he's able to bring about that and it needs to be activated. 1 Corinthians 2.13, which things we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. This scripture verse simply says that when God plants a seed, you might not understand it nor discern it, in your natural man. The man that was developed in this life. The man that has the limitations. The part of you that has the experience of everything that you went through in your upbringing. God is not going to do things in your life that make sense. What's that? God's not going to just expose you to the things that you've always been exposed to. So God's going to do some things into you that only the spiritual man in you is awakened to. So the spirit of the spiritual man in me, the Holy Spirit, is gravitating to more. The old man is gravitating to that which has always been. The old man says, you can't have that. You can't do that. You're not smart enough. You're not tall enough. You're not educated enough. And it's reinforced based on the period of time you lived in and your exposure. So in an inner city group of friends that we all were raised the same, we all have the same limitations. You can't do that. You went to school, your education was specifically designed for the confines of the ballpark you played in. I didn't go to, an, in, I went to an inner city high school that wasn't telling me about Harvard and wasn't telling me about greatness. It was telling me to stay in line. So, oh, it's indoctrination. It is in a strange way, a caste system. So the word needs to be activated. This is still a part of one. To be, receive an instruction. The message is not just good information. That's the smallest part of it. So I would hope that you leave today and say, well, that was some good information. But you need to take that up a notch. It's more than just information. It needs to produce inspiration in order to produce perspiration. The perspiration gives it the water that it needs in order to produce fruit in your life. James 1.23 for if any man be a hearer of the word, not a doer, he's like a man beholding his own natural face in a glass. He heard it, he looks in the mirror, he sees his own image, and nothing changes. Why? Because he's only exposed to the same image. He's only a hearer. But a doer activates the word and brings himself into a whole nother realm. Number two, your capacity needs to increase. Your capacity. If I want to move from believing to receiving, if I want to move to Getting more from God. How many want more from God? Maybe you don't. Maybe, maybe you're at a place where you're like, God, I've had enough. I've had enough of your goodness. I mean, I like the Holy Spirit, but I don't want too much of it. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I love your presence, but I don't want too much of your presence. I love spending time with you, but just don't come into my room, in my room and awaken me. I want intimacy, but not too much intimacy. I want kingdom, but not all of the kingdom. Once the word gets activated in you, then the word needs room to expand. Does that, does that make sense? I, I tried to, because um, I think this is where believers miss this. And so you can only receive when your capacity receives. Or your capacity increases. I have a, a, a bowl of water here. And you can see that it's almost full. And this would be equivalent to me and you. This is our capacity. So every one of us has a particular capacity to be able to handle something. Does that make sense? 
Well, here's the Lord looking down. And you might say the rock in there represents some things that kind of crept in you over the years. The old man, it could be anything from sin or offenses. So God wants to put more in you. Here's all the potential he has. But there's no room because you haven't made room for what God wants. And he's not going to put new wine in an old skin. So you're coming to church every single week, but you're not changing your capacity. Is that, is that making sense? So when God gives you an instruction, when God gives you an instruction, this is the part where many believers, they hit a crossroad. Here's what God says. I want to do something great in you. Read the text. Anywhere in the Bible God wants to do or use an individual, he is going to expand the capacity. Abraham, here's what I want to do. I need to take out of you your father's house so I can put my house in you. Now that's the instruction. I can make you a father of many nations, but I need to change your capacity. Right now, you don't have the capacity for more. So, so God's got to come in, and you, well, let me just say God doesn't have to come in. You have to look at your capacity and say, what can be removed So God gives you instruction, get rid of that. You get promptings of the Holy Spirit and you begin to change your associations. Yeah, you know, I gave my life to the Lord and I'm not, I don't feel a longing to hang around with those people. Why? Because they're quenching my capacity. I don't go to the bars any longer. I don't drink. There's this whole argument in the church. Can you drink? Can you not drink? Are you a sipping saint? Are you a non-sipping saint? For, you know, all of that stuff. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know. All I know is that I'm guarding my capacity. Now, you might say I'm favored. Oh, no. I am not favored to the degree that somehow God gave me privilege that did not require for me to do something in the process of receiving intimacy with him. So God says to me, or gives me the prompting, or I get a revelation. Not even God says. I'm not even going to tell you God told me don't hang around with those people. I'm not even going to tell you that God told me to not do those things. I'm going to tell you that based on my capacity, the longing for more, I had no desire for less. And I made the conscious decision. To get rid of some stuff. I took some bricks out of my life. Why? Because they were taking up too much space and I couldn't carry them in the journey that God wanted. Like Pilgrim's Progress, my backpack was filled with some bricks of offenses and unforgiveness, faithlessness, hopelessness. And I said, I got to get rid of these things. Why? Because it's eating up my capacity. I want more, but there's no room for more. As soon as I removed, every area I removed, here's what the Holy Spirit did. Gave me more of God. Every year, he gave me more of God. Now, you might look and say, I want that capacity, but you don't see this. Well, then get stoned for Jesus. Because they know high like a Holy Ghost high. Okay, whatever. I did say I came from the 80s, amen? <laughs> so if you're not willing to change the content and make, God can only get in you what your capacity is. Does that make sense? So God's got to get some things out of you. So the instruction that the Lord gives is not designed to be a killjoy, God's instruction for you is not to spoil your life. Not to tell you you can't have this. It's simply... Do will spiritualize it. 
and we'll say the devil doesn't want you to hear this. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure he doesn't, but I'm not too sure he quenched my microphone. Amen? Yeah, bad battery. Um, is, this, is this making sense to you? Changing capacities? And so it would be unfair to look at another person's capacity and what they're filled with and draw the conclusion that somehow for me, maybe to look at Pastor Tom and say, well, I mean, God has blessed him beyond what he has blessed me. I don't know what stones he has taken out, what offenses he has removed. I don't know what sacrifices he has made in his life to get to where he is today. I can't look at the sum total of his life and say, well, he's gotten favor when God has given me numerous opportunities to change my capacity, but I have not made those changes. Does that make sense? Your inward success is different than your outward success. Outward success is viewed or culturally identified as uh, achieving things of life. Achieving status. Achieving financial, achieving education, um, you know, that's what the outward is uh, looking at. The inward capacity talks about being immersed. It talks about strength of character. It talks about strength of humility. It talks about strength of power when it comes to the power of the Holy Spirit. So that my inward capacity, even if I am stripped of everything outwardly, the inward capacity still makes me a mighty man. It makes me a mighty man whether I have a car or whether I'm walking. It makes me a mighty man whether in the, I'm in Nigeria preaching the gospel or Haiti or whether I'm on the mission field, whether I'm in the boardroom or whether I'm in, no matter where I am, it's inward capacity and it's molding me from the inside out. Which means you can strip me of everything outwardly and God can restore it to me because I have the inward character that brings about that success. Here's what the devil said. Strip Job. Let me attack everything he has. And he'll curse you. God says his strength is not in the outward. His strength is not family. His strength is not houses. His strength is not wealth. His strength is not status. His strength is not education. His strength is that he loves me and resists evil. That's Job's strength. Job went through a living hell. But when he got to the other side, God blessed him twice as much. That living hell the devil put him through just changed his capacity. It just lengthened him, widened him, and it changed his makeup. You good? My crossroads of salvation at 16, I couldn't afford to be up and down. I had to learn how to fall on my feet. I had to survive and thrive in adverse conditions. You, you don't know this, but I worked from 11 at night to 7 in the morning, and in my senior year, I still went to school. My teachers knew that I had been through a rough time. I was sleeping in some of my classes. God had positioned me with some born-again uh, teachers that were there that extended grace to me. I didn't, even know, I didn't even know the grace that was being given to me, but I knew that I needed to get my education in order to survive. I had to figure out how to be promoted in situations where I got no favor. In situations where no one would open up a door. Uh, my work ethic was a strength to me, knowing that at the end of the day, I knew that what I could do, I would do in order to survive, which was work. And work ethic has been a part of my natural makeup my entire life. And um, I knew that murmuring and weeping and all of those things, uh, being mistreated and overlooked was not going to solve any uh, problems in my life. And that uh, 
Adversity, trials, betrayal, wounds, all of those things were designed to drain capacity. Capacity. Giving my life to Jesus simply meant that God was going to strengthen me when it came to capacity. Now, let me just say something about capacity because I don't think everyone, I think in, in many ways, I, I have up here the little cup. I started, and then I have the pitcher. Here's the pitcher, and then I have the bowl. You have to figure out what type of capacity or what type of believer are you? Are you a Dixie cup saint? You came to church with, I just want to fill my Dixie cup. I want a church where the preacher preaches for 30 minutes because that's all my Dixie cup can handle. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. I don't want to have to turn my Bibles, make sure there's enough scripture verses on the overhead. I don't want to have to take notes. We have in our visitor's packet a notebook. Most people look at it like, what's that? It's a tool to take notes. So when the good looking preacher says something profound, you write it down. Dixie cup. I gave my life to the Lord. I didn't come with a Dixie cup. I came with a pitcher. I started with a pitcher. If church lasted longer, I was excited. If the preacher said, I think revival's coming, let's come back tonight. I lived at a day where we went to church three times a week. Shocking. Midweek service was as packed if not more packed than Sunday. Because midweek Wednesday service was Bible study. And people were there with their notebooks and they were packing the place out. I remember years ago I went to this church to visit and there was a preacher doing a whole Revelation series. One chapter a week. Place was packed. Standing room only. Still good? The church doors were open. I wanted to be there. Why? Because we didn't have Google. We didn't have YouTube. I wanted to know more. Can I? I think we got it too easy in the 21st century. We got it so easy that we don't really labor for more. We just want more. Does that make? Can I? Can I just be honest with you? I mean, if you can't make it, don't come to church. It's online. Not picking on the people online. That's fine. That's, I'm not. I'm not saying that. Please read below the line or in between the lines. Uh, um, if you want to know something, you could just Google it. We, we, we want effortless exposure. Laborless success. Perspiration free fragrance. We want a God that seeks us where we don't have to seek him. We want a God that knocks on our door and waits for us to open. <laughs> Scripture verses, I know you might think that's in the Bible. We want a God that asks us. When the Scripture says, if you have not, maybe you ask not. Knock and the door shall be open to you. For us, it's too laborsome. I don't want to knock. That's too, first I got to find the house and then the door. I mean, if God wants me, let him knock on my door. Effortless. I don't want to go to church, let church come to me. I don't want to go to God, let God come to me. I want blessing with no instruction. I want success with no responsibility. I want unlimited wine, but I don't want to take the water out of the... The wine changed, the water changed the wine because the disciples went and served. You, oh, it got heavy in here. Are we good? Come, I see Pastor Kenny comes every week. He's preaching. We did midweek Bible study. I mean, I got some profound things to share with you. We have men. We started a whole men's ministry trying to lure the men to greatness. Please, men, come. We're going to labor to get nuggets 
that can transform your manhood. All you got to do is show up. Are you good? Like we're begging, begging, please, please, please. It's going to be good. 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 It's only so much a cheerleader is going to do for you. And yesterday's cheerleader can't fit in the same outfit. Oh, my wife even put her head down on that one. There's a revelation in that. I don't know what it is. You can unpack that later. Um, I've come to realize that I'm not a Dixie Cup preacher. I struggle in the 21st century. I struggle with giving you stuff in a compact microwave presentation. That's why I have props every single week. Um, God was looking to lead Israel out of slavery and into the promised land, but he had to change their capacity first. So he brought them through the wilderness. He needed to move them from renting to owning, from blaming to obtaining, from a curse mentality to a promised land mentality. Can I talk to you for just one quick second on one subject? You've probably heard it before. Anybody ever hear substance abuse? Substance abuse. Substance abuse happens when you have intake of a substance that is beyond the measurement that you should be obtaining. That's or a substance that would be substance abuse. So if you get a broken leg and they prescribe to you a Percocet to take off the pain, but now you don't have the pain any longer in the leg, the leg is already healed, but you can't get off the Percocet, you're experiencing substance abuse. Does that make sense? And so what happens is when we don't change our capacity, yet you're exposed to more word and the word has potential, the word can become something you experience through substance abuse. Too much word not rightfully applied isn't helping. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. When we have a lot of substance, but no activation, let me say that one more time. A lot of word, a lot of word, a lot of Google, a lot of Bible, but we're not applying the Bible, then all of that Bible isn't helping you get to the next level. It could be impairing you because you think you know everything. You're exposed to everything, but we're not progressing in everything. And the last one is word must become flesh. I love this. John chapter 1 verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us and we behold his glory and the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Word becomes flesh. The last process of receiving is to be able to flesh out the message. So what would that mean? So today fleshing out the message would be let's get stoned. How many want more of God? How many would like some of the word that's already in you to have some room to grow? How many would like some of God's destiny that has become dormant because it didn't have room to grow to now begin to get growing in your life? Well, then you then need to receive the instruction and the instruction needs to change the makeup, the makeup of your capacity. What needs to come out in order for God to put more in? What needs to come out in order for God to put more in? I don't know what needs to come out, but therein is the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit allows us that at an altar call or at a time at the end of the message, you can pray and say, Lord, here's a prayer God always answers. What needs to stay and what needs to go in my life? What needs to change in me? Amen. Holy Spirit will give you a list of things. 
Holy Spirit will say, this area has become a hindrance to me growing. This needs to be removed. This needs to be forgiven. This needs to be released. This needs to be changed in your life. With that in mind, I want to pray for you. Stand with me this morning.